Hey, Cypher here. I don't really know how I feel about the free state of Jones. On the one hand, it is very accurate, but on the other, it is a very bad way to tell a story. There are a few problems with the accuracy, of course, but they're mostly forgivable. What really makes this a bad movie has nothing to do with all of that. It just makes some storytelling mistakes that made this an unbearable movie to watch. But there is a lot to be commended on this movie. It is perhaps the only good depiction of Reconstruction that Hollywood has ever produced, and shows the ambiguity of Southerners' motivations during the war as well. It is truly a great depiction, but the story is discombobulated in a jarring way, so I'm very ambivalent about this film. During the American Civil War, the Confederacy was not without its internal detractors. When the war turned into a slog, desertions in the Confederate military were rampant. Especially at the Siege of Corinth in the spring of 1862, a long, brutal battle that secured the Union a victory that allowed them to safely begin reconstruction in western Tennessee and led to the Battle of Vicksburg, the decisive battle that took the Mississippi Valley from the Confederacy. A lot of Confederate soldiers were disaffected. Furthermore, there were some laws that the Confederacy enacted that made many poor Southerners become disillusioned with the Southern cause. First came conscription. They passed a conscription bill in April of 1862, the first in American history, soon to be followed by a Union one that led to massive riots in New York. Even before that, the beginning of the war saw many people being forced into service by their communities at large, but without specific laws to force them. Then there was a huge exception built into it in October, called the 20 Negro Law. 20 Negro law. If you own 20 Negroes, you get to go home. The oldest son on such plantations where 20 or more Negroes are owned or leased are hereby exempt in the armies of the Confederate States. Furthermore, any plantation where the total number of Negroes owned or leased shall equal 40, the eldest and second eldest shall be exempt from military service. That means if someone owned 20 slaves, they were exempt from service. You have to realize, slave ownership was not something everyone could afford. Interestingly enough, the vast majority of Confederate soldiers did not own slaves. Unlike what, like, a lot of Lost Cause revisionists like to say about that, though, it does not mean that the people were not vested in the institution of slavery. But when the 20 Negro Law came out, many poor Southerners began to see the war like this. Tired of helping them fight for their damn cotton. I ain't fighting for cotton. I'm fighting for honor. Oh, well, that's good, Will. I sure hate to be fighting for cotton. We're all out there dying so they can stay rich. You own any slaves, Ward? You got any Negroes to fight for? Then there were the taxes that were collected by the Confederacy. At first, property taxes were levied in 1861, including on slaves. But then came the tax in kind system in April of 1863. This made people give a percentage of their crop yield from farming to the Confederate Army. The Army also employed people to forcibly collect. It was only supposed to be 10% of crops, but of course, there were abuses of the system. Yeah, you don't want to steal our corn and our mule. You steal our corn. We got nothing to feed the hogs. We can't feed the hogs. We got nothing to put in the smokehouse. We got nothing to put in the smokehouse. We starve in the winter. That's murder, ain't it? So, Jones County, Mississippi was a strange place in that state. Mississippi is oftentimes called the most southern state by historians, and that is meant disparagingly. The state was often the worst example of the negative aspects of southern history, especially the racist laws and violent refusal to abolish them. But Jones County had the lowest percentage of slaveholders prior to the war. In fact, it was very anti-secessionist. Many in the county were very disillusioned by the Confederacy. Under the command of a man named Newton Knight, a company of men rebelled against the Confederacy in October of 1863. Knight was a deserter from the Battle of Corinth. Essentially, they rebelled against the rebellion. The Knight Company was fairly interracial because... Don't own no slave. They ain't gonna die so they can get rid of selling their cotton. Mm -hmm. That's where we live, too. <laughs> After a few dozen confrontations, and the killing of a Confederate major, the Knight Company supposedly raised a Union flag over the county seat in Ellisville. We don't really know the full extent of the rebellion in Jones, but the war was over before the Union Army could make it that deep into Mississippi. After the war, southern states passed a series of laws called the Black Codes. 
Some of these things were even built into new state constitutions. Mississippi was the first and the worst of these. The Black Codes were designed to bring back the system of slavery and white supremacy through forced labor programs and disenfranchisement laws. If any apprentice shall leave the employment of his or her master without consent, said master may pursue and recapture the apprentice and bring him before any justice of the peace, whose duty it shall be to remand said apprentice to the service of his or her master. I understand this quite clearly. Y'all get your land back. Then you go and work up some, some fancy law just last week that gets this boy back in the fields picking cotton. Stan, are we free or we ain't free? You understand. We're free and we ain't free. Presidential Reconstruction under Andrew Johnson had strove to bring peace to the South by creating the Freedmen's Bureau and trying to readmit former rebellious states into the Union again. But the Black Coats inflamed Northern politicians. So the Republican-held Congress halted the readmission process, passed the 1866 Civil Rights Act, and pushed through the 15th Amendment. Article 15, Section 1. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. They also mandated that the military would enforce this legislation in the South, effectively declaring martial law on any state that had such black codes, including some that never seceded like Kentucky and Maryland. This was called radical reconstruction. It was split down party lines. Because Johnson was a Democrat from Tennessee, the same party that was essentially responsible for secession in the first place, and Congress was held by Republicans. Newton Knight in Mississippi became a major leader of the Republicans in his county. He rallied the black vote and even helped at the local Union League, which in the South was a primarily black Republican group after the war. Despite election rigging by the Democrats, he continued to his cause. There was significant pushback by locals who lynched local activists. During the war, he had begun an adulterous relationship with an ex-slave known only by the name Rachel. He had a wife and kids with a white woman, but the relationship ended even though his wife stayed with him on the farm for decades. Interracial relationships were illegal in Mississippi, under anti-miscegenation laws, but Knight happily flouted such laws, even being buried in the same grave as Rachel, which was another form of miscegenation. Anti-miscegenation laws were removed during Reconstruction in 1868, but Mississippi brought them back in 1890. Rachel had children with him as well. Almost a century later, a descendant of one of those children would be prosecuted for miscegenation in 1948. That Davis Knight did knowingly and willfully and feloniously violate Mississippi law by engaging in a marital union with one Junie Lee Spradley, a white woman, that as the great-grandson of Newton Knight and a Negro slave known commonly as Rachel, he is of at least one-eighth Negro blood and as such meets the minimum standard to be considered a colored person in the state of Mississippi. He was very white, but because he had one-eighth black blood, he was deemed a Negro by Mississippi law. That law wasn't repealed until 1967, but Mississippi fought it tooth and nail. This movie has the most scholarship behind its production I've seen since 1976 with the film The Message. Just look at the amount of historians who advised on this one. They even had Eric Foner, the old American Historical Association president. Victoria Bynum and John Stauffer have actually written a few books on this subject. Martha Hodes wrote a book that included the miscegenation story. Jim Kelly and Wyatt Moulds are local Mississippi historians and Kelly is a descendant of Newton Knight. That's quite a set of advisors. Of course, there are a lot of blank spots to fill, and I bet you the historians on set were bickering about how the film should betray them. In terms of primary sources on this subject, there are just family and oral histories, a couple of memoirs, a few news articles from the Civil War, and three telegrams. That leaves a lot of room for conjecture. So where the film might be inaccurate, it's mostly to deal with the blanks in history, and in my opinion, it handles that aspect very well.
As a result of all those historians consulting with the film, generally the film is incredibly accurate. There's a lot of stuff we don't know, like how big the Night Rebellion really was, if they started as a group of deserters and runaway slaves, and the specifics of any battle. Generally, the film chooses to go with the ideas that make the entire rebellion seem as important as possible, rather than lower estimates. But that is still within what is allowable given the source material. But even with that, it strives not to overglorify these people. It isn't showing Knight as a man ahead of his time, or some kind of white savior. When he kills Major McClemore, it is startlingly brutal. Somehow they managed to weave in moral ambiguity about someone it would be all too easy to glorify. Though I should say that there are some inaccuracies that would make Knight a less affable character, but I'll get to those in a minute. The beginning of the film is especially good for moral ambiguity. It shows the Second Battle of Corinth in a way that emphasizes the utter futility and horrid nature of the Civil War and doesn't pull any punches, because the movie just drops you into it without warning. Every scene drips with hidden meaning about the history surrounding the subject matter. For instance, when a black man who was registering other blacks to vote is lynched, the movie subtly shows blood staining his inner thigh. Without specifically showing it, the movie alludes to the sexual depravity of many lynchings, where live castration was a common occurrence. This scene has a double meaning because it shows a batch of peanut shells on the ground, and later when Knight and the Union League go to vote, there's an armed man eating peanuts, and Knight is forced to stand across from his friend's killer without taking action. That is some seriously heavy-duty history right there. It is designed to make you understand these people in their historical context through their perspective. The movie makes you understand the historical era better than any Civil War movie I can name. It depicts disillusioned Confederates without making them seem like they were somehow abolitionists to begin with, unlike movies like Glory. When it comes to Reconstruction, there is no movie I know of that has taken such a nuanced view. Most of the time, their films like Birth of a Nation are Gone with the Wind, or even the original film about the Night Rebellion called Taproots, which are decidedly inaccurate in their depiction to the point of being blatantly racist. The Free State of Jones deserves praise on this front, because I cannot emphasize how much of a pernicious effect Lost Cause revisionism has had, and this film reverses that. It ought to be used in classrooms throughout the United States, and I fully endorse it for that purpose. Its R rating has to do with the ghastly violence and the prolific use of racially offensive words. What are you doing, nigger? That ain't for you, put it back. Back, nigger. How you ain't? How I ain't what? What he says, Ward, is how you ain't a nigger. I mean, they just pick cotton for him. You. He was willing to get killed for him. But those are important to confront high schoolers with, because, as I said, this film pulls no punches, and neither should history teachers. There are some inaccuracies that need to be addressed, but these are not the real problems with the film. I'll get to that in a bit, but I have to say these first. The boy in the beginning that is depicted as being Newton Knight's family member Can I stay with you? Of course you can, boy, you my kin. Is a composite character. He surely had kin in the army, but nothing like that. It becomes a narrative disruption, though, because when the boy is shot and killed, the movie has Knight desert the army to go bury the kid. That is not what happened. He definitely saw horrible things in Corinth, but he deserted the army in a different way. He left to go deal with his brother Morgan back home. The men had supposedly been abusing Knight's children, so he went back and killed Morgan. Knight stayed back home, though he was given leave initially. Yeah, I gotta leave. No, you didn't. That is a decidedly different story from the one that the movie depicts, and it makes Knight seem less likable. But the film skips a part that would give the opposite effect. 
Knight was captured in 1863 by local officials in Jones County. The movie does show his house being burnt, but he was in jail at the time and probably being tortured. This big scene where Newton Knight proclaims the free state of Jones may be an inaccuracy from the time. In July of 1864, a Natchez newspaper reported that it had happened. The problem is three of the Newton Knight company, including Newton himself, denied ever having seceded from the Confederacy. Though they did allude to Jones County having never seceded from the Union, so it might just be a difference in semantics. The movie goes with the more grandiose narrative for obvious reasons. There is just not enough evidence to say anything definitive in this instance. The end of the film has a text blurb stating that Serena Knight continued to live on the farm despite Newton Knight being in a relationship with Rachel. That is true for the most part, but she left around 1880 to 1890. The record isn't clear when. Rachel died in 1889, and here is where the record may vilify Newton. He began a relationship with Rachel's daughter. This was not one of their children, but a kid from a previous relationship. This other relationship even produced children. Historian Victoria Bynum has postulated that Serena left because of this happenstance, which many may judge as being sleazy. Despite the movie's accuracy, it is not an engaging film. There are some problems with the way they tell the story, and it has to do with the directorial decisions, not the plot details. Gary Ross, the director, has done some competent work before that confronts the viewer in a similar style with his movie Pleasantville, which he wrote, produced, and directed just like The Free State of Jones. The problem is, he tries to put so much into the film that it collapses under its own weight. This movie is boring. Badly boring. It breaks the fundamental rule of cinematic narrative. Show, don't tell. It commits this cardinal sin so badly that it is rendered extraordinarily boring. Bored now. This is why the movie lost money. I've already seen some articles claiming that it was the focus on accuracy. It wasn't that. It was bad directing. Let me explain how it does this. First, there are all the parts of people just doing nothing. I don't need to see some guy walking for two minutes just to understand that he's walking somewhere. Learn to cut. Ross has been working in Hollywood for 30 years, and somehow my naive editing skills are better than this. Next, there are a bunch of scenes where the movie just shows text in the corner of the screen explaining the historical context of the narrative, rather than just letting us see it. So we have to read blurb after blurb after blurb, like it's a textbook. Worse still, it suddenly drops the viewer into a bunch of still historical images at three separate points in the movie. Those pictures I'm showing are from the movie, and I'm not editing at all. What the hell? I don't watch a Hollywood movie to see a documentary. Poorly edited one at that. They don't even zoom or move the image in any way. That's just poor documentary making. I stopped doing that a long time ago, and I'm working out of my bedroom. Show don't tell. It's a very simple concept to understand. Finally, the one place where I might have comparative experience with Ross is the way you frame the story. He jumps back and forth from the story of Newton Knight to his grandson's miscegenation trial. It is extraordinarily jarring and without warning whatsoever. He tries to weave the trial into the general plot. Why would you do that? What was Ross thinking? It would make for a perfect epilogue, but not something that you just jump back and forth and back and forth. These are dumb decisions on Ross's part, and they make the movie significantly worse because of it. The long useless takes, strange documentary elements, and random jumping to the future narrative renders this film boring. That is why it lost money at the box office. So this is a good film historically, but a very bad film. I'm genuinely saddened by the fact that such a promising film was rendered into such a boring mess by bad directing. Maybe somebody can go through and recut this film so that it doesn't have such problems. After all, it just needs to be recut. So if you're a teacher, use it in your classroom. It's very good for that, but it will bore your students. Under the